Reformed Church. Uh, you know, something I wanted to mention to you, I don't know what relationship really it has to entirely to what we're going to talk about. Maybe it does, I guess, some quite a bit, maybe. Um, but uh, Pastor Mike and Miss Lindsay, Pastor Mike was just, you know, ministering to the helps ministry right before we had gotten started for a couple of minutes. And then Miss Lindsay was just ministering to all of us, right, as she was praying at the end here and as we were going through the songs. And something that I just noticed as a little thread in that that I think is really important is um, I just jotted down a little something that just said rising above the experience of other people. Um, and, you know, the reason why I think that that's important is because, um, you know, there's not a single person that I can think of, not even that I can think of. There is not even one single person today that I can look at and say, well, I can look at you and if I can be like you, right, that means that I would be exercising all the inheritance that God has given me. In other words, I can't look at a person and say, wow, that person depicts in their lifestyle and what they have and in what they show in their life, that person depicts, right, all of the inheritance that I have, right? I, there is no such person. But I, I want you to just think about that for a second. There is no person at all that has, that has uh, ever lived, really, uh, apart from Jesus, right, uh, but really in his glorified state today, not as he walked on the earth, right? Um, that you can look at and say, that person depicts all that I have from God. So, so I just wanted to ask you this question, just so you can think about this in your, in your mind. Um, if, if we can't look at a person and say, that person depicts everything that I possess in Jesus, why do we make people an argument in our mind against what we have, right? Why do we use that? Why do people then say, well, yeah, but this can't be true because look at so-and-so. This can't be true because look at Paul the Apostle. This can't be true because look at what happened to this one. This can't be true because look at, I mean, and, and I love my brothers and sisters in Christ, right? I love Paul the Apostle. I love you know, ministers today, right? But, but there is no minister today, no matter how good the gospel that they preach is, that I would actually, instead of really beholding Jesus, that I would look at them, and then if I don't see something, in other words, if the Lord is trying to show me something, is the Lord, if the Lord is trying to show you something, and what we do in response to the Lord teaching us is that we say, yeah, but, and, and, and granted, a lot of times when the Lord is teaching you something, you don't recognize that he's teaching you. You think that you just have a thought. And then you combat that thought in your mind with another thought that says, not that you're talking, not that you're arguing with the Lord, even though in a sense you are, right? But not that you're arguing with the Lord, but you would use, yeah, but how can that really be true? Like that must, I must be misunderstanding something. Or that must be something wrong that, I, that I'm getting here because look at so-and-so though. Like surely... Surely that person who is much more spiritual than I am, if this were true, what I'm saying, I would surely see it in their life, or they wouldn't go through this. Or they, but but you, follow, you follow that? Right? You, we, we, it's a horrible way of trying to figure out what we have by using other people as the argument or the agreement to that, right? In other words, so, so that would mean is we could never rise then above the experience of another person because they're going to be your measure all the time. The good news is, right, and the truth that we know that really it, we, you want the Lord to establish that in your heart, right? The good news is that there is only one measure. There is only one measure of our inheritance, right? And that, and you know, I, I said this to the Lord. Actually, he was, he was uh, sharing with me a couple of things and and I was telling him, Lord, you know what, Lord, I believe you even if no one else believes you. But that has been coming back to my mind so many times. E even, even as I'm sitting there this morning, I was thinking about it again as, you know, Pastor Michael was ministering, Miss Lindsay was ministering. It just kept coming back up and up to my mind again and again. He said, so are you saying then that if you will believe me even when no one else believes me, are you saying that I can show you and teach you something that no one else has and that you've never seen before and you'll believe me? Is that what you're saying? Right? And, and you know what? That, that, it just it brings such clarity to my mind because isn't that what we want, really? That the Lord would be able to speak anything to you and that you would believe Him even if you've never seen it, seen it in the life of another person ever. 
If you, and, and I think verbatim, that's almost, I think, what Miss Lindsay prayed, right? But, but that you could actually do that, right? That you, you would be able to believe the Lord because he is true, right? And every man that would ever contradict the truth of God is a liar. But see, but, but that's not exactly how our process works sometimes in our minds. Sometimes God says something to us. We look at the experience of another person and we say, that must not be true. You're not arguing with the Lord because you're not really maybe understanding that he's the one that's trying to teach you something, right? That it's the spirit of God that's trying to lead you into all truth, right? But, 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 but you'll put it down and you'll say, yeah, no, but if that were true, surely that wouldn't have happened to this minister or the, th- that minister or to my mother or my father or this person or that person. Surely if I could be well, this person who is much more spiritual than I am would not be sick, Right? But the cool thing is that the the Lord just says, you know, behold my glory as in a mirror. Behold my glory as in a mirror. And you'll be able to see the glory that you possess right in my face. In other words, right right in, in, in who he is and everything that he shows of the Father, right? You can tell that's everything that I have. So I just, want, I just want to encourage you today, you know, that um, I, I know sometimes uh, people have a tendency to put themselves down because we compare ourselves to other people. So, so, so in other words, you kind of think, well, you know, I'm growing, I just, I'm not where she is, or I'm not where he is, right? But, but the thing is, you know, how about if we forget the comparison, and how about if we just listen to the Lord and allow him to teach us, right? And just, and, and use as your only measure to what's true, only Jesus. Could you imagine where we would be as the church of Jesus Christ on this earth if every Christian, regardless of denomination, right, would only just be looking at the same mirror, right? There, would, there could not be any disagreement, right? There couldn't be any disagreement because even if I didn't know something, but you showed me how Christ depicts that, I would have to accept it, right? If I'm a person that is only beholding Jesus, and maybe I have never even seen that truth yet, But if what you're showing me I can see in the Lord, I would have no argument. In other words, that would be the end of dispute in my mind because I can see it in him. And you know what? That's really what's happened over the years, right, at Reformed Church. That's really what has been occurring more and more and more, right, is that uh, our teaching initially, right, our teaching initially looked and acted very much like everybody else's teaching, right, you know, very vanilla teaching around, you know, God loves us and we love him, but, but th- there wasn't a lot of depth, a lot of, a lot of speaking about the inner struggle that people have, right, a lot of, a lot of conversation and discussion and preaching about, about how, you know, People are struggling in this world. But you know what? I, I, don't, I don't want to fill my mind with the experience of other people and their struggles on this earth, right? I want to see, Lord, what have you done for the struggles and the problems that people have on the earth so that we can be the ones to tell them, hey, it doesn't have to be that way, right? It doesn't have to be that way, right? Um, so God is good. I'll just share this for you just because I don't want you to just believe me because I'm saying it. I want you to hear it even, you know, from Paul's mouth about himself, right? Because I think you've heard us say a couple times at least, and if you haven't, you know, I'll say it now, right? I, I actually said it before, right? Paul the apostle is not the picture of my inheritance, right? Paul was just an individual that was saved and loves Jesus like I love him, loves Jesus like you love him, but he is not the epitome of the example right? Actually, he says, right, he said in 1 Corinthians 3, 5, he said, who then is Paul? This is him speaking about himself. (laughs) He said, who then is Paul? Who's Apollos? He said, but ministers through whom you believed as the Lord gave to each one, right? In other words, he said, like, did I save you, right? Am I Jesus Christ? Did I save you, right? He says, I should, did, and there were, he, he even talked about even baptism. I said, I, I don't even know how many I baptized. Maybe I baptized this one and that one and the other one. But, he says, but mainly, he says, I haven't baptized anybody. He said, the Lord hasn't sent me to baptize. He, he, he's, he's called me to preach the gospel, right, to the Gentiles. So, so it's just an interesting thing. You know, when you, when you just allow, allow your brothers and sisters in Christ to be just that and allow Jesus Christ to be the the perfect representation of everyone, everything that the Father is and has and everything that we are and possess, right? And, and then just leave it at that, period, and that's it, right? And you, what you, what'll, what'll happen is you'll find yourself more and more, right? When you have questions about what you have, you look at him. 
when you have questions about you, what you don't have and what is not you, of you anymore, you'll look at him, right? Instead of looking at other people. or Because or, a lot of times what we want is, you know, you ask, hey, you ask people sometimes, hey, has this ever happened to you? Like, do you struggle with this? Almost like if you find someone that's struggling with the same thing that you're struggling with, oh, it's okay, it's okay, <laughs> right? Because it can be a negative, right? If such and such a person will look at, look at him, I mean, look at, look, at, look at how spiritual he is and he still struggles with it, so surely it must be okay for me to struggle with the same thing, right? But why? Why? why, did, why? Because, because that person is the example of what you have and don't have, and if they're still struggling with it, it's okay. But when you behold Jesus and you say, oh, Lord, but you don't struggle with this at all, therefore I don't have to struggle with it at all, right? If you have overcome, Lord, then that means I have overcome, right? That's, a, that's just a different way right, of looking at things when you behold the right mirror. Just, just good, good, good. Um, so you know what, uh, what, what I wanted to begin to talk to you about this morning uh, it has a lot to do with that, right? Because um, it's just been something that the Lord has been bringing up to my mind quite a bit uh, recently. Um, and the, the, uh, there's a couple things. So the, in the Bible, the word rain, right? I'm not going to try to define it entirely for you, but from everything that I've seen so far to this point, right? Rain depicts that which comes from heaven, right? And even do, the word do, D-E-W, a lot of times it's used in the same context. Actually, sometimes you even hear it called the dew of heaven. Right? In other words, not just that, not, not something that comes from beneath, but even something that still is coming from above, right? The dew of heaven. Um, so so when, when, again, not trying to fully and exhaustively define these two words, but I think from a, from a beginning, right, we can say that, that rain depicts that which comes from above. Now, Jesus, many times in, in Isaiah, I think Isaiah chapter 54, if I'm not mistaken, right? It, it says it's, Jesus is depicted as the rain and the snow that comes from above and waters the earth, right? Um, so so in, in the same way, right, just, just to get us kind of started along that vein, right? Rain, right, that which comes from above. And, and bread, we, we know, and we've looked at that, I think, a, a, a few times, right? That bread is that which gives life, right? Bread is that which gives life, and rain is that which comes from above. So when we talk about then the bread of heaven, right, the bread of heaven, that can be depicted both ways, right? The rain that came down and that gives life to the earth, right? The bread of heaven, right? In other words, the bread of heaven means the bread that proceeded from heaven, right? Rain saying it came down, bread means it gives life. Right? So when Jesus calls himself the bread of life, he's, say, he's saying that he's the one that came down and gave life to the world, right? Which obviously that makes a ton of sense to all Christians, right? Of course, yeah. <laughs> Thank God you did, Lord. That, right? That's how we receive sal our salvation. Um, and, and the thing that we want to see is that if you, if you have the Son, right? If you have him, right? Meaning that we have his spirit in us, right? Um, that means that we are his right that that's one thing and the other thing it is it says right if you have the son then you have life why because that means that you have eaten of the bread right you have eaten of the bread and i think that jesus clarifies in john 6 i believe he says and and the bread is my flesh the bread is my flesh right which he gave as a sacrifice for us so in other words so life came to us through his sacrifice right life came to us through his sacrifice Right? So, so if you have the Son, which means that you believe in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, in other words, you believe in Jesus Christ and Him crucified, He says, then you have life. So if we have Christ, if we have bread, if we have bread, then we have life. If you don't have bread, you don't have life. Now, that's not to be confused with bread or food that perishes and bread or food that is eternal, Right? Because bread is that which gives life, but there is a bread that only provides, right, temporal, right, uh, vitality, if you will, right? right? There is a bread that perishes, and just like the bread that you're eating perishes, if, what, if your source of life perishes, right, you already know where I'm going, right? If your source of life perishes, then what? You perish. Perfect sense, right? I mean, that's, now, now let's divide a couple of things, right? What does the world have? By itself, apart from Christ, of course, right? What does the world have? The world just has the bread that perishes. That's it. That's why everything that it does, right, 
right? It circles the bread, the food, right? Everything is around eating healthy, right? Junk in, junk out. There's all these sayings, all the stuff that you grow up, right? Because if you, that, that's, that is life, right? And if you don't have bread or you don't have food or the, the way even in, in Scripture the Lord will put it, if you hunger and thirst, what does that lead to? Death, right? If you hunger and thirst, that leads to death. Another way to say hunger is famine, right? Famine. That is, fam- famine is the absence of food, absence of water, right? The, the result of famine is death. What you'll see today is the Lord said, I will never bring you into famine. I would never bring you into famine, right? Why? Because the Lord would only ever lead us to life. That's why his son is called the bread of life, right? The bread of life. So I, I understand, and, and I, I, I'll try not to say this again throughout the time preaching because I, I don't want to major on this, right? But understand that, that in our minds what happens sometimes when you're hearing things like this, you say, oh, but that must not be for now because all I see around me is people dying, right? I'm not asking you to look at other people, right? I'm not asking you to look at the experience of other people. I'm not asking you to look even if everybody around you died. I'm not, looking, I'm not asking you to look at anyone around you. I'm just last asking you to look at him. That's all. Just look at him. Just look at him. Oh, that's, this is a really hard thing to swallow. I get it. I understand, right? I mean, even when, when Jesus told the people that he was the bread of life, he said, if you can eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will, you'll have life, Right? And it was, that was hard for them to understand. It was even hard for the, his disciples to understand. It's been hard for everyone to understand across all eternity. The truth is that God is eternal, right? I mean, th- these, are, these are like boulders of truths, right? That, that is just like, I don't even know how they get ignored. God is eternal. Men, me, humans, were they created to be, and, and don't just say this, just think about it a little bit, right? Right? Were men, men created to be eternal or to be temporal beings that are subject to death and perish? Right? Of course, we were made to be eternal because there was no death until what happened? Until sin came in, right? So, so men were created to be as God, created in his image. Somewhere along the line, we lost that image, right? Right? We traded in the image of the eternal God for another image, right? And we began to fashion ourselves uh, among other people, and we've been comparing ourselves with other people ever since, right? We have been, Cain and Abel were comparing themselves against each other, right? We have been comparing ourselves among each other, among people that are just all dying, right? We, we've been comparing ourselves uh, among each other forever, Right? But there is something that has happened to us, though, as believers, right? There is something that we have that they don't have. That you, you have to acknowledge that, right? God is eternal. And he's given us something called what? Eternal life. I, I, right now, we, we don't have to even try to define what eternal life means. There's a big hint in there. There is a huge hint. I mean, it slaps you in the face every time you read it. Every time you read it, it slaps you in the face. But you, you throw down that argument because of the experience of others. Because you that are reading it are still alive, but you have seen and experienced the death that is in the world, right? And you throw down that argument every time God would try to show you something about the life that he's given you, which is eternal, we find a way to confuse it in our mind. God is eternal, right? And part of the inheritance that we have is, right, well, the inheritance that we have is the eternal spirit of the living God, right? If you look at Jesus, death has no dominion over him. He says that as clear as a bell in Romans, right? If, looking at Jesus as death has no dominion. I believe it's Romans chapter 6. Death has no dominion over him. But then just let's carve out that little bit and let's make it into a mirror. Look at him and see. In other words, he, he's saying it, right? Not to show off and say, ha ha, death has no dominion over me. <laughs> Sucks to be you. <laughs> right? That's not what he's saying. Right? Why is he saying that? Why would God point out, not, and not just have a man say it, but, but actually get it written and keep it for thousands of years written in the Bible, right? That death has no dominion over it. I mean, just a wild thought. Why would he leave that there, right? And if Christ is our mirror and, and it says death has no dominion over him, why would we so readily accept that death has dominion over us? Why? 
just one reason, the experience of other people. Not who he is and what he has. The exp- there is no other reason. The experience of other people, that is it. There is no other reason. It's just the ex- It's not because we, have, we don't know that we've been given this thing called eternal life. It's not because we haven't seen time and time again people, Christians, giving life from the life that they have to other people, right? We, 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 there have been, there has always been, always been around the body of Christ since the day the Spirit came down and even before the Spirit was come, right? Even as the Spirit was even working through the lives of other people, there have always been experiences of people receiving life through other people, right? Always. People being raised from the dead is, is a regular account in Scripture. But, I, but I, I know, that, in other words, the reason why we put those things down is only because of the experience of other people. So what I want to show you today is, I, I just want to show you the trajectory of what happens, right? What, what, what is it like to have Christ? What is it like to, to, to be able to continually uh, emphasize in our minds, right, what it means, right, when, you, when, when we see that he is the bread of life, right? Let's go real quick to 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17, and there's a layer, obviously, here that we're going to read it. I think there's quite a bit of symbolism in uh, 1 Kings 17, and obviously, and we know that, obviously, because we know that the Bible was written. The Bible wasn't written, like, in other words, 1 Kings 17 wasn't just so I would know the story about a widow who, you know, uh, didn't die. Right. In other words, the first King 17 is written like like the entirety of the Bible is written. So right to to be able to testify about Jesus Christ. So something happens in your mind when you begin to read scripture, not as something that can tell you whether or not God wants you to move to Florida or not. But when you start reading scripture to just learn Jesus. Right. Because you see what you're doing. You're you're looking into. Right scripture you're looking into the perfect law of liberty and the one you want to see is jesus you see what you're not doing what you're not doing is you're not trying to see you know you're not trying to see god correcting your bad behavior because look at what happened in david's life and the same thing is happening to you and you're gonna die if you don't if you don't stop right but instead if you were to look at scripture to say lord show me jesus you would actually be in line with what the spirit of god inside of you is trying to do he's trying to testify to you about jesus and and telling you at the same time i'm teaching you i'm teaching you about myself jesus said the spirit that you have in you he will take of what is mine and he will declare it to you right so he's, he's speaking and teaching us Jesus, right? And at the same time, that reminds you, and remember now, you're a son of God. So if I'm showing you the son, remember, you're a son of God. You know what that makes him? Your mirror. Testifying constantly, his spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. I wonder why he would want to do that. Why would this Holy Spirit in us want to constantly remind us that we are children of God? Remember, you're a child of God. Remember, you're a child of God. Remember, you're a son. Remember, he's your father. Remember, he's your brother. What what, what is it with that, right? He wants to show you what you have, right? He wants to show you what, what, what your lineage is like, right? And nobody can go as far back. Nobody can go as far back as we can go, right? Our lineage goes all the way back to to my father, to my heavenly father, right? And I have adopted and become just like him. I have his same temperament, right? I have his same attitude. I have his his same inheritance. I have his, his same power, right? I am as my father is, right? Not like my earthly father. I am as my father is, right? Everything of my earthly, earthly father, anything that I, that I ever got from him, apart from faith, I don't want. Thank God I have the faith of my earthly father, and I have the faith of my earthly mother, right? But I don't have their characteristics, right? Now, if I look at their characteristics going back to the same lineage, then yeah, that, I agree with that, right? Because if I'm, like, if I'm like my heavenly father and they're saved, that means they're just like, so ultimately, that's why I, years ago, years ago, I used to, when I used to teach, uh, I used to teach children, they, they used to say, oh, Pastor Jose. I said, you know what? That's true. I, said, I used to tell them, I am your pastor. I said, but you know something else. I'm also your brother. Did you know that? And they look at me, brother, right? What do you mean you're my brother? Right? But it's this thing, and, and, and that is why, you know, like, you, we call, 
I don't know why we don't say sister so-and-so, but we say like brother Matthew, right? He actually is my brother, right, in Christ, but he is my brother, right, which is tighter than any blood relation can be, right? He's my brother in Christ, but, but, but we don't say like sister Kim, right? We say miss for some reason, but the truth is, right, the, we, we are brothers and sisters in Christ, so that means that the more that I know Jesus is the more that I know myself, but also the more I know you. That's why the apostle said, now that I consider Christ no longer after the flesh, but I consider him after the spirit. We, we, so, so also, right, we can't consider one another after the flesh anymore. If I don't consider Jesus after the flesh, I can't consider you after the flesh. Right? It doesn't matter what I see you do, right? That's why I can encourage you. If I see you do something, I know, I, and I know that you're his, right? If I know that you're saved, I know that you're his. I see you doing something that you shouldn't do. I can encourage you and say, hey, what are you doing? This is not you. And I can say that with all surety. This is not you, because I know, because it's not me either, right? So I, so I don't have to put you down. I can just encourage you and remind you who you are, right? I can remind you who you are, not who you're not, right? I can remind you who you are. There's a, there, there's, a, there's a definite way to correct people and help them, and it's not by putting down what they're doing. It's by reminding them who they are. See, isn't it funny that that's the same way God corrects us, right? He doesn't try to correct what we're doing by telling us what losers we are because look at what we've done and you're backsliding and you're doing all this stuff, all these words that people make up, right? But instead, right, what he tells us is look at who you are. Just lift up your eyes from where you have them. Lift up your eyes and look at me and I'll remind you once again who you are. Just, just get right up on the bandwagon again, right? And keep beholding Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Um, in verse number one of 1 Kings 17, it says, and Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead, as I said to Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall, be, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. So Elijah comes to Ahab. Ahab, it says in the previous chapter, in chapter 16, that he, he, he led the people of Israel into more evil than any king that had ever gone before him. He led them into more adultery, in, into more, um, more idol worship, right, than ever any other king had before. Um, and and a Elijah, who was a prophet, right, a man of God, the Lord would speak his word and he would speak that word to whoever, right, <laughs> was in front of him, right? And, and he wasn't a very popular prophet at, in that time. And the reason why he wasn't very popular is because he would always speak the truth and people didn't like that, right? Actually, Ahab would come to him and Ahab had a little nickname for Elijah. He called him the troubler of Israel. And it's because he, he was depicted as someone who was always trying to bring doom and gloom, but he wasn't. He was telling them, you're going the wrong way, right? You're going the wrong way. What you're doing, right, is not what God wants. Like, look at what it is that God has for you. Look at it at what He what He wants for you. Look at the life that He that He wants to give you, right? But like many kings, right, earthly kings lead people down a path that they will not go. So Elijah goes to Ahab and he says to him, "They shall be no 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 dew or rain all of these years, right? Uh, these years it says, except at my word." Now, what that meant was. It's not, you know, Elijah's not trying to flaunt the fact that he can just say, you know what, stop raining until I say so. He's not trying to show off. He's, you know, he's, he's expressing what the Lord has said to him that he's going to do. And what he's saying to him is, right, I'm trying to show you life, right? I'm trying to show you life. And, and symbolically here what he's saying is that there will be no life on this earth except by the word of God, right? In other words, Life does not come to earth except by the word of God, right? Meaning, without Jesus Christ, there is no life on this earth. Without Jesus Christ, there is only, right, temporal bread that will lead to death. The, the, that's called the bread that perishes, right? That's all that there is. That's all that there is to hang on to, right? You, you, can, you can hang on as tight as you want, but the thing you're holding on to is rotting as you're holding it right like like this that's just it's it, it's it's a it's a condition that the world was in but the lord already had that under control right he says i'm gonna fix that i have made i i i have i want them to be as i am i want them to be as i am not suffering not suffering it says the reproach of famine as they have been 
And he saw his people, he started with the Jews, he saw them, right, suffering the reproach of famine. The reproach of famine is nothing more than living in the bondage of the fear of death, constantly living in that, that way, right? So, so, so he's, he's telling Ahab, there is no life except in Jesus. I don't know if you see that, right? He, say, he said, when he tells them, there will not be any dew nor rain. In other words, there will be no bread that will come from heaven and give life to this earth unless you believe the word that me, a prophet of God, is speaking to you. God is speaking through me to you, and if you don't believe this, there is no life, right? That's what he's communicating. There will be no dew nor rain these years except at my word, right? Um. So in, in, in verse 2, he says, Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. So right away, right, to a, a man that will believe the Lord, right? Obviously, we know, right? Anyone who believes me lives. It's just, it's just the law of the spirit of life, right? If you believe me, you live. If you believe me, you live. Keep saying that in your mind, right? If you believe me, you live. What's the prerequisite for life? Believe, right? <laughs> there is no other prerequisite to continually live, which is to believe, right? W why is it that people don't continue to live if they stop believing, right? right? It it's just a limit to their understanding, right? Don't, don't judge what you have or what you can have based on what somebody else has. It doesn't matter how spiritual they look. Just you pay attention to him. In other words, like I, I tell you, I'm saying it to you, and I can hear the Lord saying it to me again, right? right? Just you look at me, right, and let me show you the limitless possibilities that are yours, right? You, you just believe me. So that really is the question, right? It's the same question that the Lord asked Martha, right? Martha and Mary. He said, he who believes in, in me, he who believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? He said to her, do you believe this? That's all, right? He who believes in me will, let me find it for you, <laughs> right? I, I, I want you to make sure you don't think I'm making this up, right? Um, I believe it's in John um, 11. John 11, verse number 26. John 11, verse number 26. And whoever lives, we're alive, right? right? Whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. <laughs> now, I don't know exactly how we get clearer than that because that's pretty clear, <laughs> right? But he says, and whoever believes, she's, she's talking to two women whose brother has just died, right? And who he himself is going to raise up from that death. Right? This is a perfect scenario to explain what he's explaining. He's dead, you're alive. He who believes in me, right, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this, right? Do you believe this? You know why? Because he was teaching them a little something. He, says, he's, he said to them, he said, didn't I tell you that if you believe, right, you would see the glory of God, right? That you would see the glory of God. See, that, that's what happened when, that's what begins to happen in your life when the Lord says to you, can I, can I teach you anything and will you believe me, right? Or, or will you compare what I'm saying to you against the experience of others? I don't think there's a Christian alive that has breath in his lungs or in her lungs, right, ever that would say that they, that's what they want their life to be, right? Lord, Teach me whatever you want, but I will constantly, Lord, compare that against the experience of other people. And I will only believe it if I can see it in them or in myself, right? You, you'll never see it. <laughs> you, you want the reason why? Well, why, why? I mean, we could go into that. We probably don't have to. Why aren't more people raised from the dead? Why don't you see this today? Why do you have this problem? Why do you have this? Why do you have the other thing? Why was El I mean, I have read stuff. Why was Elijah bald? Why was this? If he's a man, what in the heck does the hair on Elijah's head have to do with the life of God on the inside of you? We've gone to the depths of looking at the follicles in this man's skin on top of his head to determine whether we have eternal life or not. That is a horrible argument, right? Horrible argument. Like if that, and, and then but the thing is, people say that like, oh, I got you now, right? You don't know what to say. You know what? 
it's like, you think you got me? <laughs> Listen, you keep looking at Elijah's head, I'll keep looking at Jesus, right? You got me? <laughs> like, you think that's okay? You want to keep looking at Elijah's head, and I'll keep looking at Jesus, and you think you got me, right? There is, there's no comparison there, right? There is the, if, if the best argument that we have, again, is the experience of other people, my God, right? We, we can go so much farther, so much farther, so much farther. But he, he told them in John eleven twenty six. 26, he said, and whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. He said, do you believe this? My God, do you believe this? Uh, let's go back again then to 1 Kings. Um, so he, right away, he begins to take care of Elijah, right? Like, like he always had. Elijah believed him. I don't know to the extent that Elijah believed him, right? I'm not trying to compare how much faith he had. I just know he did believe the Lord, right? How do I know that? Because I can see the glory of God being manifested in that man's life. Therefore, I know he believes. I don't know how much he believes, but I know he believes. So he said, get away from here and turn eastward and hide in the brook Cherith. That's verse number three, which flows into the Jordan. And in verse number four, he said, and it will be that you shall drink from the brook. And I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. You know how cool it is? This is, this is a really cool example of how we can live day-to-day -day lives, not seeking the things of this world and having everything just added to us by God. Right? Th that, is, that is such a... Uh, that is such an awesome way to live in our liberty, right? To not have to chase after stuff, right? Not have to chase after fame and fortune, but let him make you famous and rich, right? But you don't have to seek it at all. It, you don't even have to be mindful of it, right? You don't have to be mindful of it, right? And he, he, will, make, he will make the work that you're doing, right? As he's working through you, that the... the Everything you do prospers. It's done with excellence, right? Y your work is known, and it's just God doing. God, it's God working in and through you, making everything you do to prosper, right? Making you wealthy just because of the renown of the work of God through you, right? My God, commanded ravens to feed him there. In verse number five, so he went and he did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and he stayed by the brook Cherith, which flows in the Jordan. Now, just keep in mind, ravens, right? Ravens perish. Bread and meat that they were bringing him perish. But it's fine. If it perishes, he brings you more, right? If he perishes, he brings you more. But the point is it, it does perish, right? It perishes. Um, and you'll see why I'm saying that in a second. Verse number six says, the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up. It's a temporal source. It's not an eternal source. The brook Cherith was not, well, why did it dry up? I thought God was you. It's a temporal source. There's another brook that he could bring him to, right? God is not limited, but the brook dried up. Fine. So God, so, so, oh, I got fired. He'll get you another one, <laughs> right? Right? He'll get you. If they couldn't appreciate the excellency of your work and they actually fired you, not for your performance, but just because they hated your guts, then, then fine. And God will prosper you somewhere else, right? If we get fired because we're doing a lousy job, then we ought to allow the Lord to work through us more and more, right? And then they'll see the excellence of the work that we can do, right? Because you can do things with excellence, right? You can do things with excellence. So, so we don't have to play the victim. If you got fired because you weren't doing a great job, get another job and let the Lord work through you and do better, right? That's all. But anyway, so, so he went. Uh, sorry, where are we? Uh, verse number 7. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land, right? So in other words, there was no life. They had, there, was, there was no rain in the land, meaning there was, no, there was no bread that had come from heaven, right, to give life. So when there is no, no bread from heaven to give life, things perish, things dry up, right? And it happened that the brook dried up. That's not surprising, right? Just like it's not surprising that I see people that are in the world that don't have Christ and they die. And you're going to see a great example here in a second. Then in verse number 8, the word of the Lord came to him saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, he says, which belongs to Sidon, he says, and dwell there. He says, See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. Right? So now he's going. The Lord sends him to a woman that doesn't know, know the Lord. Right? She doesn't know the Lord. But she's saying, But I have, I have commanded her to provide for you. There's the interesting things in there, right, that she talks like, he hadn't told me nothing, right? Like she's talking like, I, I don't got nothing to give you. But it works out, right? That w when, when the Lord speaks to you and you believe him and you speak with authority over, th over things of the earth, right? Things in this earth, right? Right? Things heed what you say, right? When the Lord speaks to you, 
things heed what you say. That's why you can speak to someone and say, be well, right? Rise up, cancer be shriveled up and die, and it, it listens to you, right? right? Because it's the Lord speaking in and through you, right? We have his power. He's our father, right? So it says um, in, uh, he, he says in verse number nine, he says, I have commanded the widow there to provide for you. Verse number 10, so he arose and he went to Zarephath, and when he had uh, when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there. She was gathering sticks and he called her and she said, please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And, 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 it, and it's interesting. Like he said that even that I'm sure was, she was stretching herself, right? Because there was a famine. It was, I mean, the entire brook just dried up, right? So there was scarcity of food and water, right? But, but she was going to get him a drink. Uh, and as she went in verse number 11, as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So she's asking a woman, right, who does not have life to give him life. She's asking a woman who does not have life to give me life, right? Uh, so uh, as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So, so she said, as the Lord your God lives. Not as the Lord my God lives, as the Lord your God lives, right? I do not have bread, right? In other words, I have no life, right? So, I ha so what, what I'm holding on to, right, what I'm holding on to in this world is the bread that perishes. And, and, and out of all, everywhere where I could go to get it, I only have this little bit, right? I only have this little bit, Right? And actually here she's saying, I don't even have bread. In essence, she's saying, I don't have bread because I have a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil, she's going to say in a second. But what she's basically saying is, I don't, I, don't have, I don't have bread that can be multiplied unto you. I don't have bread that can be multiplied unto you. In other words, there is a bread that's multiplied unto us. There is a life that's multiplied unto us from our inside, right? There is a life, a bread that is multiplied unto us, right? If the same spirit that lives in Christ that raised him from the dead, that multiplied unto his body and rose a dead corpse, right, that was missing the majority, if not all of its blood, right? He rose that from the dead. He says if that same spirit dwells in us, surely that spirit in us will give life to our mortal body, to this dying body, right? That's what is Romans 8, I believe, right? So, so what he's saying is that that life in us can multiply unto our bodies and even multiply unto the body of other people. But she's saying this bread that I have doesn't multiply. This bread perishes. I don't have, this, I don't, I don't have any bread, right? I don't have any life. I don't have any life. You're asking me for life. I don't have any life to give you. In verse number 12, she said, as the Lord your God lives, I, don't, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Why, why is what she's saying so true? Because she doesn't have the life of God, right? She doesn't have the life of God. So because she doesn't have the life of God and she's in the middle of a famine where there is no rain that has come from heaven to earth to give life to men, right? Then she's, all, and all she can hang on to is the bread that perishes. It's all that she's holding in her hand. If, the, if your source perishes, you will perish with it. If your source of life perishes, then you have no eternity. You also perish. But if the source of our life is changed, right? Then our life has changed, right? If your source has changed, now if your source hasn't changed, then you, you're right, right? I mean, she's right, right? She's going to eat it, and that after she runs out, she's dying, guaranteed. <laughs> as surely as Elijah's God lives, she will die, <laughs> right? Truth, right? Truth. But he, listen to the answer of the, of, of the man of God. Uh, and actually, sorry, <laughs> Before we even get there, uh, she, sa she said at the, at the end of that piece, that she said that we may eat it and die, right? That we may eat it and die. Look, at, look real quick at uh, 1 John 5, 11, and then we'll come right back uh, to verse number 12 or 13 for that matter. In 1 John 5, 11, it says, and this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. See, he's given us a different kind of bread. Bread is life, right? He's given us bread that is eternal. In other words, a bread that does not perish, so if your bread has changed, right, then that, that, that means that you yourself 
have become a, have what that source has given you, right? Eternal life. You, you, you see the interesting thing? Every Christian agrees they have eternal life, but they just don't know what it means, right? They say they have it. Not that they're going to get it. They're not, no, no Christian says, I'm going to get eternal life. Do you have eternal life? Yes. Yes. But it's like it's this thing that's in them that cannot come out, right? That's, that's the entire concept behind Miss Lindsay's song, Bursting Forth, right? This was not intended to stay inside. And Jesus Christ agrees with that, right? It was never intended to be like that. It was intended to be, he says, he said, there's coming one. He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit, right? And that spirit in you will become in you a river of living water. A living what? Living water. Living water. It'll abound unto you, right? Abounding unto you. That's, Jesus said, Christ said that's why he came. I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. In other words, that it would be multiplied unto you. Multiplied unto you. It says, and this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life, the eternal one he's talking about, is in his son. So it says, he, he, this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And that life is in Jesus. And in verse number 12, he says, he who has the son has life. So, so the only way you get out of saying that you don't have it is if you don't have him. Like the widow woman, right? She didn't have it. I have no bread. But if you have him, then you have life. And he who does not have the son, like the widow woman, right, does not have life. Real quick, John 6, 27. John 6, 27. It says, do not labor. Don't work. Don't seek after. Don't chase after the bread that perishes. <laughs> He's such a wise God. Isn't he wise? Right? Look into the foolishness of not listening to him. Don't chase after. Imagine this, just a mental picture real quick. You're running after something with all your might. As you grab it, you, get, you can't grab the whole thing. You get little pieces of it, and it's disintegrating as it's going. But you're chasing it, right? I mean, with all your might, all your strength, all the power in you, you're chasing after, and you grab pieces of it. And, and it, but it's, it's falling apart as it's going. And you know what people do? They keep chasing it until there's only a little crumb left at the end. They're still chasing that thing. That's the ignorance of laboring for food that perishes, right? We're chasing after things in this world that are falling apart. <laughs> Everything is dying in this world. What in this world is worth you chasing after, <laughs> right? It's, it's all falling apart, right? He, he says... <laughs> He says, do not labor for the food with perishes, he says, but for the food, the bread that endures to everlasting life. Why? Because he said that you can grab it and hold on to it, and it does not, it doesn't change. It stays just like your father, the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's what you have in you, an unchanging source of life that is the same forever. And that it, as it's multiplied unto you, it never diminishes in quantity. Never. You can give tons of it away to the whole world, and you still have the same amount of life in you. The same amount of life in you. Right? It says, endures to everlasting life. It says, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him, right? It's a beautiful thing. He said, I have the, my, the Spirit of God. I'm going to give you that Spirit, right? And you'll have what I have. So good. He, last little bit, in that same chapter, John 6, if you go down all the way to verse 58, the, the, the people, listen, that, that the Lord had just fed. He fed 5,000 people, right? How did he feed them? He took the bread that perishes it, and he multiplied it, right? That, that's not normal, right? This is, remember, this is the bread that perishes. This is the bread that if you chase after it, it's, it's falling apart as it goes, but what did he do with it? What did he do with the bread that perishes it? He took the bread that perishes it, and instead of it disintegrating, he did the opposite to it. He multiplied it so that, listen, listen, so that everyone ate as much as they wanted. As much as they what? As much as they wanted, not just as much as they needed. <laughs> like, here, you had enough, and then you have to take a piece out of your mouth and give it to your baby because you had too much, right? As much as you needed and as much as you wanted, 
And then he said, go around and collect everything that's left over. And they had 12 basketfuls left over, right? Right? That's not the, he took a bread that perishes, right? And he made it a sign and multiplied it. I wonder what he was trying to tell them, right? That he is the bread. Not that. He didn't want their eyes on the bread, right? He didn't want them then to make a shrine and make a loaf and start bowing before a loaf, right? He wanted them to see that he is the bread of life. That, I, that this, this multiplication, right, of life is what I can give you if you would just believe. But you know what they did? They came after him because they got hungry again and couldn't find him. And then when they found him, they said, how did you get here? They don't care how he got there. They just want more food, right? But, but you know what he said to them? He said, he, he said to them, he said, you seek me not because you understood the sign. He says, but you seek me because you ate and you were filled. You see what he's saying? You're, you're chasing after something that's dying, right? He says, instead, he said, if you would have understood the sign, what, what, what was the sign that he wanted them to understand? Just as I multiplied, right, the, the, that bread it was multiplied unto you, so I am the bread of life, right? And I will multiply my life unto your bodies, right? I will multiply my life unto others' bodies, right? He, he said to them, but no, sorry, then they said to him, they said, they said, well, listen, I know our fathers, they ate manna. God sent them bread from heaven. And he said, you don't get it. He said the manna, right, was the same symbol that I taught you a few days ago, right? A few days ago, I multiplied bread. Manna from heaven was bread that perishes also. What happened if they took the manna, if you remember, what happened if they took the manna and they kept it overnight? It would breed worms and it would stink, right? Because this is the bread that perishes. Jesus said, that's not the bread you think it is, right? I am the bread of heaven, he said. He said, your fathers, in verse number 58, your fathers ate manna and are dead. Why? Because when you eat of a source that perishes, so do you perish, right? But if our source is a heavenly source, right, the rain that has come down from heaven, right, the bread of life is our bread. If Christ is bread to us, then we got something pretty special that the world does not have and that we can then tell the world that is dying, I got good news for you. You don't, you don't have to live like this. You don't have to live anymore, watch, afraid of death anymore. Not because, not because, <laughs> I know I said this before, but I'm going to say it again. Some people say that the reason why Jesus said we don't have to fear death is because death is just going to ravage you and you're just going to die anyway. But then what the Lord is going to do is he's going to raise you up. Um, I may not be afraid then, but then if that's how I'm supposed to live, I'm going to be afraid now. Because if death can just ravage me right now, then I'm going to be afraid. I should be afraid, right? In other words, the Lord doesn't say don't fear when the thing can actually kill you. But, but that's why he says, right? But if, if something doesn't have dominion over you, then you have no reason to fear it, right? But if something has dominion over you, in other words, if death really has dominion over me, I should fear death, right? So I haven't really escaped the fear of death just because he, I'm gonna be raised up at some point, right? But the good thing is I don't have to fear, but there's a reason. And there are people that still love Jesus, right? Love God. But, but they still do live with fear of death. In other words, when they hear certain words, when they're diagnosed with certain things, fear comes into their mind. And that's not because they don't love Jesus. It's just because they still believe that it has dominion over them, right? And it doesn't mean if you get diagnosed with something, doesn't mean you don't believe that it, you don't believe that it doesn't have dominion over you. It's just that you want to continue to hear because that's where faith comes from, right? That's where faith comes from. So, so if we go, let's jump back real quick to verse number 13. First Kings, and we're going to be wrapping up here. First Kings 17, 13, and I'm going to go very fast. <laughs> First Kings 17, 13. And Elijah said to her, right, she said, she said, I'm going to eat this and I'm going to die. I'm going to eat it and I'm going to die. That means that he knows, just like the Lord knows, she was living under the bondage of the fear of death, right? Bondage of the fear of death. In, um, he said to her, can, can, you, can you bring us, Colin, real quick, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 15. Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews 2.15. He said that the Lord came, it says, to release those who through fear of death 
were all their lifetime subject to bondage. He said he came to release us from that. He came to release us from what? From where she was. The fear of death because we were all our lifetime subject to bondage. In other words, we were in bondage to death. Right? You couldn't do anything about it. You were going to die. Why? Your source dies. Of course you're going to die. Right? And, and you were afraid of it. And you lived all your lifetime, right, preparing for it. I know we, we try to put rosy things, you know, we try to say like pretty things about death, but there's nothing pretty about it, right? People can say whatever they want about it, but there's nothing pretty about it, right? So there's no reason to try to doll it up. It's an ugly thing, right? It's not good and it's not what God wants for us. That's why he sent Jesus, right? So, so if we jump back again to verse number 13, 1 Kings 17, 13, and Elijah said to her, do not fear. In other words, I know that you fear death because you see your source, right? And you see that it ran out. So you feel if your source ran out, you're going to run out. He says, but I can teach you something. (laughs) Don't fear. Go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me. And afterward, he said, make some for yourself and your son, because thus says the Lord God of Israel, not your experience, not what you've seen in this world, but this is what God says. The bin of flour, right? The bin of flour, same as the manna, same as the 5,000 being fed, same sign. Same sign. The bin of flour shall not be used up, and the jar of oil will, and uh, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until when? Until the day that the Lord sends rain on the earth. You see, what he's saying to them is, right, they're living in a time before Christ. He said, I'm going to keep you going. I can keep you going all the way until the time that, that my Father sends the rain from heaven that will give you life right? That's, that's, when, that's, that's when you can switch sources. You can, when Jesus has come, when Jesus has come, we can switch from the bread that perishes to the bread that gives life, right? When did the manna cease in the wilderness? The day that they came into the promised land and ate from the crops that they did not plant, right? That the manna ceased, right? Why? Because they switched bread, right? This was the bread that perishes. Even though, even though it was manna and it was a symbol of Jesus, but it stopped immediately. Why? Because they entered into the land. They entered into the new earth. They entered into the inheritance that you and I have on the inside of us. We switched bread, right? We have switched bread. We have switched bread. He, he said, he said that's, w- that's when it'll stop. And it won't stop, he says, until the Lord sends rain on the earth, right? That was the sign that he was pointing to. In, um, in, look, look at John 6.51. John 6.51. He says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven, right? The rain. I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever, And the bread that I shall give him is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world, right? That's why he's called the bread of life. He gave us his flesh so that we could have his life, right? What an an awesome thing. Uh, Isaiah, we don't have to go there. Isaiah 55, 2 says, why do you spend money for that which is not bread? Why Why do you chase after that thing which is not the bread of life? Why? Why do you chase after that? It's falling apart, right? Why do you chase after that? Why do you spend money? Why do you labor? He, Jesus said before, right? Labor not for the bread which perishes. Here he says, why do you spend money for that which is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy, right? In other words, it, it always runs out. <laughs> you, you take from that bread that perishes and you will hunger and thirst again. It was the same exact thing. He's trying to teach this to everybody, right? The woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, what was he telling her? He says, Every, this, if you drink from this water, you'll keep coming back because you're going to keep getting thirsty over and over again. You will always thirst. But if you drink from the water that I will give you, you will never thirst again, right? What is he trying to say? That she'll never be thirsty again, right? That she will live forever. That he could give her the bread of life, he's saying to her, right? Why do you spend money for that which is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me. Don't listen carefully to your, the experience of other people. Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance, right? It's making the hairs on my back stand up, right? <laughs> he, said, he said, eat what is good and let your soul delight itself in abundance, right? You, you see like the sense of like, 
richness and abundance that the, like the picture that he gives you is like you don't even know what's good until you let me show you what's good right the people that do not believe right that refuse his gospel he says to them he says they cannot see when good comes right they can't see when good comes ezekiel 36 29 Ezekiel 36, 29, he said, I will, del- this, is, this is the part in Ezekiel 36 where he says, I will give you a new heart. I will take out the heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh, right? In other words, faith in the Lord. He, he says in verse number 29, he said, I will deliver you from all your uncleanness. I will call for the grain and multiply it. Same exact sign, right? Same symbol that he's using, right? I'll give life to you right? I'll give life to you, he's saying, right? I'll give you a new heart you'll, because you believe me and it will mo- give life to your mortal body. He said, I will deliver you from all your uncleanness. I will call the grain and multiply it and bring no famine upon you. Bring no famine, no hunger, no thirst ever gone. You don't even know what hunger and thirst is anymore, right? He says, and I will multiply the fruit of your trees and, inc- and the increase of your fields so that you never again bear the reproach of famine among the nations. So you never again have to bear the reproach of hunger. So you don't have to live like the world lives, right? You don't have to live like the world lives. You do not have to live like the world lives. Thank you, Jesus. Look at uh, John six thirty three. John 6, for the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then, he said to, then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. You know what that is? The end of famine. The end of hunger, right? You've switched your source. You have switched bread from the bread that perishes to the bread that gives eternal life. Bread that is multiplied. I just wrote this little, these two sentences down. Bread multiplied is the absence of hunger. Life multiplied is the absence of death, right? Bread multiplied is the absence of hunger, right? That's why he's the bread of life because he satisfies, right? Isaiah said, Isaiah, well, the Lord said really through Isaiah, right? He said, he said why, do you, why do you labor? Why do you chase after the thing that can never satisfy you? He says, come to me and you'll be satisfied completely. Complete. Not, with, not with the little teeny little baby satisfaction that you're thinking about. I'm talking about satisfied like you have never another need and don't feel like you ever need anything else for the rest of your life. Ever. For all eternity. Done. Satisfied, right? Bread multiplied is the absence of hunger. Life multiplied is the absence of death, right? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Um, in, it's 12.04. I want to end. Um, I want to read two things to you if you just allow me to. I want to read to you the last two verses and then Isaiah chapter 40, and I'm going to do that very quickly, okay? Um, in verse number 15 of 1 Kings 17, so she went away, the widow, and she did according to the word of Elijah. So, so I, I know this was a long time ago, <laughs> but she basically told them, right? She said to him, make bread and give me bread first. And the Lord is saying, it'll, the jar of flour, right, the, the, the jar of oil and the bin of flour will never run out until the Lord sends life from heaven, right? And uh, so she went away and she did according to the word of Elijah. And she and he and her household ate for many days. He said, the bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke to Elijah, right? We can partake the same way. If the Lord can speak something to you that you can believe despite what you see in the world or in other people's lives, Christian or not, right? If he can say something to you and you'll believe him, right? We can live, we can live out everything that we have on the inside of us, right? Our salvation being worked out. Thank you, Jesus. Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. Um, it gave a similar picture here, but he, said, he says to the people of Israel along the same lines, right? People that are living with the fear of death. He said, comfort, yes, comfort my people, says God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity, her sin is pardoned, right? Death actually obviously came from sin. And when the Lord says, you know what, you're afraid of death, and he says, I have forgiven you all your sin. If you don't have sin, then you don't have death, right? 
He says, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Verse number three says, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. And he goes into this whole thing, which is John the Baptist, right? Preparing the way of the Lord. So he's saying, you're fearing death. Don't worry. There's one that's coming. This is, I think, approximately, I think, as opinion, right? About 500 years before Christ ever came. And he was speaking the exact words, right, that, that, that would describe the coming of John the Baptist and Jesus Christ here in Isaiah to them. He says, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain hill and hill brought low. The crooked places made straight and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, right? The glory of the Lord, like you'll see the glory of the Lord. And all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. He, and then and the, the voice said, cry out. And he said, uh, what shall I cry out? that all flesh is as grass, and the loveliness is like the flower of the field. In other words, right, everyone has a source that is perishing, right? Therefore, just like the grass fades when the sun hits it, just, just, just like it says like the flower shows its beauty, and then it corrupts, right? That, that's how my people are. But he says, but there is one coming that will change all of that. That's the comfort that he wants to speak to them. That's the comfort that he wants to remind us of today. And that's the comfort that he wants us to speak to a world that's dying, right? He's saying, the grass withers, the flower fades in verse number 7, because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. We are not, right? But if you don't have Jesus, right, you don't have life. Therefore, you are like grass, right? So when you hear, when you hear things being said, right, that, that we are just like the grass and, and we blow away, you're identifying with the wrong thing. <laughs> That's not you. <laughs> That's not you, right? The grass withers, the flower, flower fades, but the word of the, our God stands forever. The word of our God stands forever. Thank you, Jesus. You know what? Th th there is something, there is something, and, and I, I'm done right here. Um, if, if you really look, even, even beyond just the things that, that we've been sharing this morning, with this and so many other things that the Lord desires to show you about Jesus Christ and the things that are yours and the things that you have, the, the one thing that I would just implore you and I would ask is that you just continue to be able to have a heart that's just open to him. Listen, I understand the risk that there is in opening up your heart to men. I understand that, right? And I would never ask you. I, I know what's in men because the Lord knows what's in men. And men cannot be trusted, right? I understand that. Men cannot be trusted. Done. We agree, right? But when you, what, there is a discernment that you have by the Spirit, right? And you have a measure that you can see. So when you listen to someone, we don't have to be naive thinking, you know, depending if they sound really excited and they're sweating, it must be a good truth. Or if, they, if they're speaking very eloquently and very intelligently, then it must be good. Or if a lot of people are excited about it, that must mean that it is good, right? No, no, no. It, it doesn't matter if no one's excited about it. It doesn't matter if the whole world denies it, right? If you tell me something, Lord, right, or if I hear a minister of the gospel, or if I hear a son, or if I hear a daughter, or if I hear a child, or if I hear anyone speak a word to me about what I have, and I can see it in Jesus Christ, then I know that no one could ever say by their own power or by the power of a spirit that is erroneous, right, that, that, that they could ever speak something to me that I can see in him. The devil would never do that. He would never speak something to me that I can clearly see in Jesus, right, because he would be only hurting himself. So if you want to know what the spirit of error is and what the spirit of truth is, just ask yourself one simple question. Do you see it in Jesus? And if you see it in him, then it is true. And if you don't see it in him, then it is not true. If you have something that is ailing you and you don't see it in him, that is not of you. If you don't see it in him, it's not of you. It is foreign and it should not be allowed to continue in your body and in your mind and in your life. It's not of him, therefore it's not of you. No matter what manifestation you still see from thoughts in your mind, you are who God has said that you are. And you are a child of the king, and it don't matter how you feel, and it don't matter how you're thinking about yourself, and it doesn't matter how wrong you have judged yourself or other people, you still are who he says you are until you learn the truth of who you are, right? You still are who he says you are. So, so we might as well begin and shift 
to look at the one who really is our mirror, not just for this, not just to understand that we can have life from the dead, not just to know that we can go and raise the dead and cast out devils. It's, it's not just to know that. It's to know everything about who Christ is. So when you hear something, whether it be here or anywhere else, don't get too excited by the eloquence of the people or by the excitement of the speaker, right? Do you see it in him? And if you see it in him, that's worth getting excited about. If you don't, then you might as well throw it away because it's no good. We hope you enjoyed this message from Reform Church. If you have, please share this with someone else and help us get this uncommon truth out to the world. If you'd like to support this good news, you can do so at reformchurch.com give. Also on our website, you can take advantage of our free messages, articles, and even full discipleship courses. Start reforming your mind now at reformchurch.com.